Hi everyone, uh, as, as, as Monkey mentioned, I've been here before. I think this is my fifth time presenting here at, uh, at DEF CON and I'm pretty excited to be back. Uh, I'm, I'm getting to see some friends I haven't seen in a long time. It's been about eight years since I've been to DEF CON, but I've been coming since 1999, if you can figure out then how old I am, <laughs> uh, which means it was a long time ago. But I continue coming back because I really love this crowd and I love the skill set you all have because I know the kind of amazing work you do and I'm going to talk to you about some stuff we're doing at UC Berkeley and also with a fantastic nonprofit. So before I start the slides, I met Austin at ShmooCon and he got up and gave this really great presentation. Uh, is he, I'm not lying, it was good. And it was enough to say, well, I want to volunteer for him, uh, for his nonprofit, what he's doing. So he's combating human trafficking using skill sets that you all have. Uh, Intel analysts, um, if you're a red team type of person, the way that you solve problems, we know is extraordinary. And we'd like to uh, talk to you about some stuff that we do, both at UC Berkeley and his nonprofit. So, um, so let me get started. Uh, yes, we're going to be talking about subverting authoritarian regimes and getting to the, some of the organizers of human trafficking and some of the organizers of, uh, I'll, well, I'll, I'll show you. We have some interesting clients we've had at UC Berkeley's Citizen Clinic. Now, a lot of you might have heard about Citizen Lab up in Toronto. We are different at UC Berkeley. Uh, what we do is we take, um, I'll go through the slides and I'll show you a little bit more about it, but we take nonprofits that are high risk and I'll explain to you what, what that means. And when I took over the class about three years ago, I kind of upped the high, high risk that we take. I'm not sure uh, Berkeley's always happy about that in a sense, but we have done some work for very brave um, nonprofits to help the directors and the volunteers continue to do the work that they do. Um, because for most of our nonprofits, security is not their thing. It is ours. So uh, we step in and kind of take that burden off of them so they can get back to doing stuff that matters and make big changes. Uh, so this is me. Uh, last time I was up here on the stage, I was talking about hacking industrial control systems. In fact, Dora the SCADA Explorer is here in the audience today. <laughs> and um, so we, uh, we did some SCADA hacking. Uh, um, but I'm, I do mostly car hacking work. In fact, my day job, I work for Berkeley as a, as a part-time instructor, is I do contract work, sometimes for automobile manufacturers, sometimes for the US government. I do car hacking. And I started doing a lot of that here at DEF CON. Uh, and so, um, Austin, do you want to come up and talk about your background? No, okay, well, this is Austin. Um, awesome Austin, there we go. Maybe we can call him that for the weekend. Uh, but he started this nonprofit and I cared so much about what I heard. I'm like, I, get, I can volunteer for this too. I, I have time to do this and I was glad to. Uh, so what is civil cyber defense? It's the first bit of the title in our very long title <laughs> that we have here at DEF CON. And um, this, is, this is what it is. And this term was actually coined by uh, Craig Newmark. Craig Newmark was, uh, he started Craigslist and Craig was, has been found um, giving uh, donations to organizations, nonprofits, such as the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at Berkeley. They fund my class and he funds them. There are other places around the country, and I'm going to reference another one that he funds, which is um, in, uh, uh, in New York. It's uh, Columbia School of Journalism, White Institute. And I'll tell you about a case that they have going on that's tangentially related to something I'm going to tell you about that we saw too. Uh, so as I mentioned, Citizen Clinic's different than Citizen Lab. We don't do forensics, but when we do find stuff that's interesting, and I'll show you something in here that is, uh, we give them a call. Um, but we are looking for people to volunteer, and I'll get to that too, uh, that have that types of uh, background. So what we do is we, we do defense for these organizations. So uh, this is how it goes. So if you were a student at UC Berkeley, and some of you are in here, and I know you are, um, uh, that have taken my class, I teach two there. Um, one is Chris Hoofnagel's class, and he is here today as well. And that's an introduction to cybersecurity. And this is in the Mike's program at UC Berkeley. And it's a graduate program for cybersecurity, and it's all remote. So I'm from the DC area, and I've only been to Berkeley's campus once in three years. Uh, it's a really good program for cybersecurity, and it's a lot of fun. And the other class I teach is the one I'm talking about here too. I take two clients per semester for Citizen Clinic, and I only like to take 14 students into my class. And I do not just pick cybersecurity background students from the Mike's program, um, which is the uh, master's program for cybersecurity. 
We have, we've had journalists, we've had uh, statisticians, we've had people from um, the Information Sciences School, because sometimes we have a lot of data to go through, and they're really good at doing that, maybe even more so than some of us in cybersecurity. So um, we, I take students from all across the university, and not just graduate students. I have about one or two undergraduate students I let into my class every semester, too. So what I do is I break the class in half, seven on one team, seven on the other. Some students of mine, maybe they have a security clearance and my high, high risk client is a little bit too much. It would be a lot of work for them to do reporting and stuff, so they choose the lower risk. But still a client that um, has had a need, they have faced threats, and that is a client usually is, is domestic. So it's someone in California perhaps, uh, has a nonprofit, and it's uh, for many different topics. And we choose one uh, domestic and international. And so the first six weeks of the class, because I have students who don't do cybersecurity, they don't know what know a tour is, things like that. We, you know, we, uh, we love Google, and I'm gonna tell you why I love Google in a few slides next, but um, uh, we got them off of Google for doing searches for clients, you know, because we teach them how to hide online. It's very important for the protection of our clients and also for their safety. So I, <laughs> I teach the first six weeks and I put them into sort of a crash course is, Here's how you hide online, and you cannot, please do not. I, I usually say, do not make one mistake one time. Your alias is going to be blown if you just hop onto Google and start doing some research. So with all of our clients, it's not quite this high risk, but I want these students to know what it's like in case they ever do take some jobs where you do have to work in the dark web using aliases. None of the clients know the names of my students, and they don't know what they look like either. And we don't use Zoom. <laughs> so we do for our classes, but not for meeting with the clients. The reason for that is we're assuming that most of our clients have already been compromised. So we're making sure the students protect themselves um, because you see, some of the clients we take are, um, they're taking on organized crime and they're taking on governments uh, that are adversarial to democratic interests. So um, first six weeks they do that. The so second six weeks, I run it like a company. So I'm the CEO. I will manage every bit of the project they do. I'm not going to micromanage, but I do watch to see if they're making recommendations because ultimately when that final report goes out, uh, it's a representation of me, uh, my professional license is in Berkeley. So the second six weeks, they meet with the client, and it's like running a company, and we put out a work product at the end. So as I mentioned, we use high security procedures. So I've done this kind of work um, in the past with research. I've worked for a lot of companies where uh, I got to teach students how to use a VPN. And um, I'll show you the tools that we use uh, in another slide, um, but it's, that's one of the basic things is teaching them how to do that. And uh, as many, most of the tools we use, because we do have a, a, a modest budget as well, we're a 501c3 as well at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. So sometimes the super expensive, awesome tools you all use for the companies <laughs> and develop for the companies you work for, we can't quite afford. So we do the best with what we have. So I gave this presentation a couple of days ago and someone came up and said, why are you using that VPN? And I'm like, it's what we can afford right now and it's the best we can do with what we have. And this is the kind of mindset the students, some of them come from big companies, some of them are at sea levels for big cybersecurity companies coming to get their master's degrees. They feel a little uncomfortable at first, but if you're gonna do work for a nonprofit, one of the things that's respectful for us to do is say, hey, what's your budget? And we need to work within that, and we do at Citizen Clinic at as well. We have a budget too. Uh, so I have strict NDAs. If my students break any of them, I just kick them out of the class. <laughs> and uh, My students who are here from Berkeley today can attest to this, that the first class, I kind of scared them a little bit with the NDA uh, because I wrote it. And um, it's uh, pretty important to make sure that we protect, again, the client. Not all clients are like Austin's nonprofit. Many don't want ever to be known that Berkeley helped them. Uh, again, it's another vulnerability to know where the researchers or you know, the cyber defense came from. So some clients don't want uh, to be associated with Berkeley. So so students can't ever talk about that. They can say, we had a nonprofit we worked with in, in um, El Salvador. You know, great, let's keep it broad so we don't want um, them being identified if they don't want to. And here's why. So I get a call in the middle of the night and someone went from my class, I, I give out my phone number for emergency purposes and they're like, hey, our client just said they have Pegasus on their phones. And I'm like, no way. For a nonprofit this size, they don't have a big budget. That can't be right. Who'd you hear it from? The nonprofit. And they said, well, who'd the nonprofit hear it from? Well, from Apple. I'm like, okay, let's take a look at those emails. And in fact, it was legit. Uh, this was surprising to see because for those of you who don't know what Pegasus is, it's a very expensive surveillance tool. And it's supposed to only operate on uh, phones and uh, that are not with a plus one like US country code. 
I won't comment on that, but it's interesting to see this on our nonprofits, um, uh, the director's phones, and it was kind of concerning. So we did what we could to preserve the evidence in case there was a very future case coming up, so my students got to learn about that, chain of custody. Um, so it was an interesting experience, but it was kind of eye-opening to the students, like, if we'd blown our alias, if our image had been shown, yeah, you guys would all be in Pegasus. And I know I was. I'm up here talking about work I do. It's just part of the job, but not for my students. So they were protected. But uh, there is a similar lawsuit that we did not, uh, Berkeley did not um, uh, join this lawsuit, but it is um, against NSO Group. There are a couple going on. I believe Apple has one against NSO. And also uh, Columbia University's um, Knight Institute, also funded by Craig Newark, by the way, uh, puts some grant money there. They are pursuing this against NSO. Um, to uh, There are journalists from El Faro around the same time that our client in El Salvador was um, uh, got this infection, so did the journalists. And what our client did is they were helping people escape organized crime in El Salvador. So they were helping them migrate out of the country or hide in the country in safe houses. So you can see how it was pretty serious when we heard about this because the kind of work we do at Citizen Clinic, people's lives are on the line. And let me show you, there's another example I have for some of um, the clients we've had without naming who they are. But again, I, I take students from all of these. I haven't yet had one from law in Berkeley, but I'm hoping. And I would love uh, any attorneys in the audience to come help me with uh, some of that work if you're able to volunteer. I'll talk to more about the volunteering in a minute. But uh, okay, so I also am intending this video perhaps will be watched by some people that are gonna start clinics in the future and some uh, universities. You do it all, okay? So if you are the instructor for this, you are starting up a company with contracts, insurance, all that stuff that isn't as fun but is super important. You also need to know stuff about PCI DSS. These are things that we've come across. I won't read through all this, but you need to also keep an eye on all of this. Like you're managing the company, you're, you're helping clients from the past that, you've, you've ref, um, that have worked with the Citizen Clinic. I do that, I keep um, contact with clients in the past, like how are you doing, have you had any, uh, any incidences? Managing the clients that are current and then looking to get new clients for the future. Part of what I'm up here doing too is if they're nonprofits that are high risk and would like some help, contact us at uh, Citizen Clinic at UC Berkeley. So you're managing all the students. Sometimes they don't all get along, so you're kind of doing HR stuff as well. But language translation is a big thing. When we put out a final work product, if it's all in English, that's not going to be so useful for clients uh, that need it, for example, in Cambodian um, uh, in the camera. So these are some of the things that you got to manage. So you run a company with 100% turnover every four months. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. It is not at all like teaching another university class, but it is so rewarding. That's why I'm up here talking about it that it, I mean, I've, I've taught in the university setting for 19 years and I've never had a class this exciting, this dynamic, and that takes us many hours. <laughs> it's, there's some weeks where I spend 20 hours on citizen clinic work, but I love it. So. Here are some of the tools we use. And I know you're not gonna see this in the back in particular. I try to get as much in here. I was asking my students, like, am I forgetting anything? Um, this is just the start of a list that we don't really, didn't really have a list and we put it all together. But we do all kinds of research online too, as you can imagine. Um, we, um, we also make sure that if the students are communicating, we use stuff like Signal, like, we know we're not a big fan of WhatsApp, but you know, we tell our clients that too, please use Signal. So these are some of the recommendations. And if you're thinking the recommendations we give for our clients, clients are super technical, they're not. This is stuff that, that the term is kind of, <laughs> I don't really love this term, but it's cyber hygiene. It's basic stuff. Use a password safe. This is some of the consulting we have to do. Others gets a lot more technical, such as actually taking a look at, for example, what's on people's phones, that, you know, if their phones have been compromised. But generally, a lot of the work we do is very general. And teaching the students this stuff too, in particular ones that are not in cybersecurity, is very important. Uh, here's here are just some of the clients that we've had, and I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, some of the interesting ones that, that were really important to me that I really enjoyed working with is uh, there were migrants coming over on boats from Africa and the Middle East, and they were landing in Greece, and they were put into migrant tent cities. And in particular, uh, women and children that have gone through that process, uh, a lot of them were survivors of sexual assault, and there was a healthcare provider, uh, both psychological care and healthcare, in the, 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 um, in the uh, migrant uh, tent city in Greece. 
The problem was is that there were American psychologists volunteering using their own laptops and that was medical information that was being collected by some physicians. It was not being protected as it needed to, so we had to uh, do some HIPAA and GDPR because it touched some servers in Europe as well. So that was a very interesting uh, client that we had with that. Uh, there, there are others in here. Um, have you ever, if you work in physical security, have you ever had to secure a tent? <laughs> we did. So one of our clients had a tent in Tijuana. And one of the last weeks we were working with them, they called me up and they said, we just found GPS tracking units on our vehicles. And these are two women who are American attorneys that are down there taking business from the coyotes and from, which means also from organized crime. And they're helping people through the legal migration process. Really amazing work they were doing. Someone wanted to know where they lived and where they went after working in the tent in Tijuana. So we, uh, we, we helped to try to figure out, track where that GPS came from. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time to do that. We had pictures of it and that's about it. But we were securing how their documents were stored because some of that was HIPAA too. They were also taking uh, records, medical records from in particular women and children that have, uh, were victims of sexual assault as part of their migration process to the border. And that is being used to create some of their uh, case files for, um, for the refugee status. So uh, we were doing all kinds of stuff that's not just cybersecurity. I think you can see now why I accept a broad variety of students from the university. So uh, here's some examples. We recently had one also in uh, Cambodia. They are an organization that are working to, for democratic government. If you know a lot about Cambodia's history, they've had an authoritarian regime for a long time. And just as we were finishing up with them, they said that someone in their organization, not a director, but one of their volunteers had been arrested. And this is difficult to hear because it's nothing we can help with, but we knew that someone who had been on some of um, the meetings uh, was being, being held in detention because he was not supporting the current president. So uh, again, the work we do is, is hard. It's very exciting. And I, I, I guess I mentioned, I love it. If you do this kind of work, you're going to love it too. Let me tell you about some opportunities that you can do. Are you here from academia? If you are, come find me at this conference because I want to talk to you. There is a grant process that's out there. And uh, Google has a very generous fund. So, um, and I'll tell you about what that is, but well, here it is actually, it's on this slide. Um, about $1 million is gonna be given to clinics uh, that, that go through an application process. And I think about maybe half a dozen, or no, actually it's more like a dozen are gonna be chosen uh, to receive this grant. But you gotta be a university to apply for these grants, I believe. Um, and uh, the consortium for cy uh, cybersecurity clinics at UC Berkeley is sort of organizing this process, but the grant comes from Google, so we are very appreciative of that. That is also some of that funding is going to come to Citizen Clinic, so we can buy some more tools, and uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. These are the clinics that exist in the United States right now. Not that many yet, right? I, I feel like we, we, can do, we can do better, we can get some more, so, so let's do that. If you, um, if you want to start a clinic, uh, contact me here. And I know this is a large URL and I realize you can't click on it online because uh, you have a PDF, but um, I have a form that you can fill out and I'll get you to who you need to talk to in the consortium uh, that we have at Berkeley if you want to start one. And now let me introduce Austin to come talk about his nonprofit and why they're going to be our client at Citizen Clinic in the fall. Come on up, Austin. Morning. So Tiffany didn't uh, mention that I absolutely hate uh, public speaking. And uh, at Black Hat, there was these nice bright lights so I couldn't see anybody but the first row. And there's a lot of you in here. So thanks for coming. All right, so I started this organization back in January. I've been in the business for about 10 years. Um, you know, we, an operation that we had last year was um, uh, we rescued 83 girls from Dominican Republic that were Venezuelan and Colombia, right? That sounds really great, um, but in reality, 83 girls just gets replaced within a matter of weeks, right? And the bad guys figure out our TTPs or our tactics and techniques of how we found them, and they just adjust fire and move, you know, so just the whole cycle starts over. So I, I said, we've got to do better as an industry. Uh, you know, A to Z, all uh, this industry is not doing what it should be doing, right? And law enforcement and the government are really handcuffed. They don't have the, the resources, the funding. So, you know, nonprofits are really stepping in and kind of offering some of what uh, to local law enforcement and international law enforcement uh, organizations, what they don't have. Sorry, somebody's calling me. Um, 
So this is our mission is to identify, map and disrupt transnational human trafficking networks with a nexus to the United States. And the reason that we, we want a nexus to the United States is because in a lot of these countries you can't get some sort of prosecution or some sort of civil action against the, the bad guys, right? So we try to draw that back to the United States so that you know, law enforcement or prosecutor's office or international organizations like the UN or the Organization of American States can take some sort of sanction action against people that are trafficking human beings. Um, these are some of our partners. Some important ones to point out there, Skull Games. They are doing fantastic work. It's a, a group of uh, former special operations guys that just uh, kind of gamified hunting uh, traffickers, right? And um, the next game is in October. Um, so I definitely recommend you guys go and check out what they're doing. Another one is Collective Liberty. And then all of these folks here have, you see Berkeley's up there. All of these folks here have done something to, to uh, you know, support us or, or uh, um, uh, given us tools or Hackers for Charity. This guy in the front row here with the blue uh, shirt, he's from Hackers for Charity. My organization would not, would not exist without him. So definitely come see them over at the vendor section. Uh, they're near the pineapple. This is the fastest growing global crime, right? Uh, it is bypassed arms trafficking. Um, it is bypassed, I, mean, I, I would say there's probably enough to say that it's bypassed drugs at this point, narcotics trafficking. Um, but you know, all the, all the data out there is guesses at best, right? There's nobody, you know, the, these bad guys, they're not uh, submitting 990s or you know, annual reports that we can pull up online. To, but I think the evidence exists. And this is some of the numbers, right? Uh, 28 million victims in the category of labor trafficking, which covers organ harvesting, sex trafficking, so on and so forth, right? 12% um, growth since 2016. That is about the equivalent of the entire population of DC has been enslaved, and that is the right term to use. They've been enslaved since 2016, right? And that's just growing larger and larger every single year. So this is our strategy. We identify, map, and disrupt. Uh, we look at patterns in a specific area, whatever that may be. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about one of our operations in a minute. But we look at all the data points. We put, try to put them together, and we find those, those trends and those patterns. Um, we then, once we've identified that there is some type of network, we try to map it end to end. And then we work with uh, you know, a separate team to come up with strategies to disrupt it. So there's a, an old Carver method of, of uh, quantif quantifying and disrupting. Um, that's, that's what we try to use. These are some of our metrics of how we, uh, or excuse me, our metrics of how we uh, identify success. You're gonna go to uh, a ton of the websites out there for organizations and they say, oh, we saved 10 billion people this year. We rescued blah, 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 right? You're never gonna see that clicker on my website because I think it just kind of re-victimizes victims. We don't work with law enforcement that arrest prostitutes, right? Um, I just don't think that it's productive uh, to arrest. It's kind of like putting a bunch of drug addicts in prison. It doesn't really make sense. Um, but we look at uh, how do we, how do we, how many, how many uh, target packages have we sent over to law enforcement? How many networks have we mapped? Uh, how many victims have we identified and pushed into programs that will help them get out of this lifestyle? Uh, and then arrest and prosecutions, right? So these are two of our projects, Operation West Keg, which is kind of a, more, a larger project and then we have smaller projects underneath. That's essentially looking at networks operating within the state of Texas that have a nexus to somewhere outside of Texas, whether it be internationally or not. Um, ideally, we want to map from Houston down to Peru and Guatemala, uh, you know, and find what, where those networks are. Because if you can't shut down the, the um, the, the organizations themselves, the best ne next best thing is to shut down the supply networks, right? Um, and then Project Key, uh, actually Project Key is this guy right here with the camera waving. He came up with a great idea that, um, he's one of our analysts, he came up with a great idea of uh, getting the word out about sextortion. And if people aren't familiar with what sextortion is, uh, it's one of the biggest issues that are teenagers are dealing with in the United States. Um, they're using, over social media, they'll be using like uh, the lover boy tactics. Um, and, and most of the time it's just a, you know, a sock puppet account that they're 
um, getting young girls and young boys to fall in love with this you know, anonymous person um, and then getting them to send um, sexual photos of them naked and then extorting them for them. Um, you know, I think a, a, as of today, there's been like 12 kids that have killed themselves over this. So it's a, it's a really big issue. And, um, you know, go to the website and take a look at both of these if you're interested in more information on this. This is Houston uh, for Operation West Keg. We looked at uh, we looked at everything for um, from Yelp data to it, just everything and made a heat map. And this is what we're looking at now of all of these commercial industries or these commercial uh, enterprises that are networked together, whether it be money laundering or any a variety of any other issues. I think that was quicker than last time. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to hand it back over to Tiffany and she's going to tell you about uh, one thing. This email is not working. So just Austin at Traverse Project. Just take my last name out of it. Yeah. That was my mistake. So, um, <laughs> okay, so, so I can pick them, right? So this is one of the nonprofits. I was like, I want to show what we, you know, the type of clients we have at UC Berkeley in the Citizen Clinic. And I, we're so excited to work with Austin this fall. Which brings me to another thing is we're here to talk about what you can do if you want to get involved in these topics to do some things with your skill set. So I know many of you uh, work for organizations where you get one to two weeks off of paid uh, time off for volunteering. Uh, uh, Citizen Clinic via Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity is a nonprofit, 501c3, and so are they. So if you have time, they would love to have some volunteers. They're looking for volunteers that perhaps have intel analyst skills. Uh, well, actually, any, anyone, anyone who's interested in helping out, even if you're in marketing or sales, you know, getting word out about what they do is what they're looking for. Um, at UC Berkeley for Citizen Clinic, um, we're looking for uh, subject matter experts. Can you come and guest lecture for our class? Can you volunteer? You may not know the name of the client, depending on the how the client wants the NDAs to, to be created, um, but you know that if we pick them, they're awesome like Austin's uh, nonprofit, but uh, they may not want you to know their identity, but they do have some problems that some of you have the skill sets to solve. So we'd very much like to uh, have some volunteers, so if you, uh, if you're interested, you can contact us here at Citizen Clinic as well. And uh, we're, we're creating a list. So I'm going to send you a Google form. And then on the Google form, you're going to have, there's going to be some information about what would you like to do? How much time do you have to volunteer? Do you want to come guest lecture? Uh, so I'm going to tell you just a brief story. Um, I was at Black Hat with Austin doing the same presenta presentation two, uh, a couple days ago. And after the presentations, uh, someone came up to us and he said, uh, he might be here today. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to name him, but uh, he said, uh, I, I, I helped write Pegasus. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, uh, thank you for coming to our talk. I wasn't quite sure what to say. And he's, he said, I'd like to help volunteer. I'd like to talk to your students about uh, how Pegasus was created. This is obviously public knowledge now, how the exploits were, were written. And uh, I'd like to volunteer my time to do some work for the clients that you have at Citizen Clinic. Hearing that was one of these things like, man, all those long hours and like our classes for me on the East Coast, classes are on West Coast time, go to midnight for me. After working all day and I do classes all night, it was like one of these things that if I had one of the developers for Pegasus coming to volunteer, I'm like, that's great. Um, I feel like it's it's my work. My work has been done in a way. Uh, so I'm... Um, you don't have to be a creator of Pegasus to come volunteer for us, but it's one of these things that if you have specialties, again, if you're an attorney, if you do uh, uh, compliance, you do like uh, PCI DSS, it, it really, we're looking for a broad range because when we step into an, um, an, uh, like a, cli a client meeting, I don't know a lot about what the problems are until we start taking a look. Uh, network engineers are always useful because we do see some stuff like that. If you're like a master at, with Google Suites and how to lock all this stuff down, uh, I got someone from Apple come up to me at the last talk and they're like, we can do a presentation on if they have an iPhone, how we can enhance privacy. I'm like, great because I don't know all of this stuff. It's hard to, I mean, it's, you can imagine how much it is. And um, we would love to have some volunteers uh, to assist us with this. And uh, with that, let me just say that we're really glad um, to be here talking to you here at DEF CON. And here, come on up. So if you want to reach out to us, please do. And uh, we appreciate your interest in coming to hear about the work at uh, UC Berkeley Citizen Clinic and with Traverse Project. Is there anything else you want to close yeah. with? If anybody has any questions, just come and find us. We're, uh, I'll be at, at the Hackers for Charity booth, um, and we'll be here if anybody wants to come talk. 
And if you are a student at UC Berkeley and have taken my class, I have challenge coins for you. You have earned them. <laughs> and I'm like 20, but I, you have earned those. So come up and talk to me and I'll, I'll give those to you. All right, thank you.